So uh, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, I'm delighted to be here in this uh, virtual format. So thank you so much to the organizers for having me and to everyone that is uh, listening uh, in today. So I will be talking about accessibility and creativity through sound design in film and television for visually impaired audiences. And I guess one of the really important things to um, mention is that it's not going to be a very traditional uh, audio engineering or music tech uh, talk. It's uh, a, a talk that uh, in which you will see no stats, you will see no numbers, uh, there's no graphs, uh, there's basically not many images uh, for reasons I'll explain in a second. And oddly enough, there are no sounds, which is uh, might sound a bit strange. But the reason why I've decided to do this is because what I want to do today is to introduce you to a number of concepts in the field of accessibility and disability studies which I strongly believe should underpin every and any project that works on audio and accessibility. These are core issues that all your projects, if you're working on accessibility, should be looking into. So I don't want to distract you with examples because they're all online. And I want instead, or I hope that by the end of the session, you will have gained uh, more awareness of this concept so that you can apply them to your own work. And I will let you know um, as we go through where you can find the examples so that you can listen to them in a better quality without the, um, the issues of uh, loss of quality through streaming. Now, one other thing I thought I'd tell you at the start is something I tell my students. When my students uh, are choosing dissertation uh, topics, uh, either at undergraduate or postgraduate level, I give them this uh, slightly odd piece of advice. I always tell them to research things that make them angry. Now, that sounds a bit strange, and I would like to clarify that I, I'm not angry all the time, um, unless you're about to do something that makes me really angry. But I do think one should choose uh, projects you feel passionate about and that you feel address issues that you'd like uh, to see solved. And uh, I have a real passion for social justice and how we can address social justice through uh, the arts. So all my projects have in common that uh, I try to use sound design uh, and spatial audio and knowledge from the arts and humanities to try to create a greater diversity and equality through the arts. And this will become quite evident in the next slides. But uh, the tip for you is research something that makes you angry and that will, that will move you forward. Now, a few things to uh, start with. So there's three main uh, topics that I uh, think are crucial for projects in accessibility that I will be introducing you to. And just a note, when there's there's not many images in the slides, uh, my specialization is uh, to work with people with visual impairment, so I don't use many images. When there are images on screen, I will be describing them, um, and everything that is text I will be saying, so um, that the presentation is fully accessible for anyone with sight loss. Now, what are those three uh, key issues that I'd like to talk a little bit about today? One of them is how accessibility works in terms of workflows. Many of you might, might or might not know this, uh, is that accessibility is 99.9% .9 of the times a process that is outside of the creative process. For example, outside of the process of making a film or television program. So in the case of uh, my interest in visual impairment, Traditionally, uh, we use something called audio description. Audio description is a third uh, person commentary that describes what is in the visual side of a film or television production. And uh, it can also describe sound elements that might be deemed difficult to uh, follow without uh, a verbal description. But this process is created by, uh, completed by an audio describer after a film or television program has been completed then someone comes as an accessibility expert, writes the uh, audio description script, which we call AD, and records it. So there is no connection between the accessibility team and the creative team. Now, this is a little bit of a problem, uh, I think, and others do as well, because audio description uh, follows what uh, is often described as a tenet of objectivity. It's supposed to be objective. But that is actually not really possible because the moment we decide what we describe, the tone of voice we describe, at what speed we describe, we're making decisions that are no longer objective. It's impossible to provide an objective 
audio description. So there is a very, very good um, case for actually bringing together creative and accessibility forces to provide something that is uh, different. And we're going to be talking about that uh, in a second. The other really important thing about projects uh, in accessibility, I think, is that um, it's a bit of an, an, an ironic thing. Accessibility, one would think, is about acknowledging diversity, acknowledging that not everybody accesses media in the same way. But the field of diversity is generally, sadly, not very diverse. In the case of audio description, we generally have two choices. We have audio description on or we have it off. That does, is not an acknowledgement of diversity. That means that if someone uh, finds that audio description doesn't work for them um, and they prefer something else, and this could be um, different needs depending on types of sight loss, but it could be just an aesthetic preference that is different, then there is actually no other option than audio description on or off. So accessibility, uh, we will consider today, should be a, a kind of a, a force of encouragement and acknowledgement of diversity. The last one is one that, uh, that uh, potentially irritates me more than anything else. And it's uh, projects on accessibility that do not think about the end user. A really important message I'd like to leave you um, with you today is that in projects with accessibility, and actually one could argue in every project, the researcher is not the most important person. You are not the most important person. I am not the most important person. The most important person is the end user you are designing for. And that is something that is often forgotten. Uh, and I'm gonna show you why you shouldn't forget this. So allow me to give an example of something that has nothing to do with audio or um, accessibility, but you will see what I mean in a second. Now, the picture shows a pack of what is branded Big Crystal for her. We see a pack of apparently 16 pens, black pens. They tell us it's a sleek design. And we see these colorful pens uh, in a package. So uh, literally what has happened is that Big a few years ago, I don't remember when, uh, this is not new at all. I think they discontinued the product. <laughs> um, decided that women needed special pens. I, I don't know why. Uh, I, I'm holding a pen here and I, it's not a big for her pen. And I am completely satisfied with the product. I have found uh, that my gender does not, um, does not intervene with my uh, use of this pen. Now, why is this relevant to uh, end users being at the center? I wonder, well, I think I know the answer to this. Did Big ask? consumers what they wanted? Did they go and ask women, did they want a special pen? Are they going to buy more pens just because they come in pretty colors? I suspect they didn't. I suspect they just thought they knew best and they went and launched a product of pens for uh, women. If you are building a project on accessibility without asking end users what they want, what they would like, then I'm sorry to say, you're just as bad as big. And do you want to be as bad as big? Nobody wants to be as bad as big. So really, really important that you consult your end users. And by consulting, I mean more than what we see typically is we create something. And then when we've already created and we're happy with it, then we do testing sessions and we ask end users what they think. That's not a very inclusive approach to accessibility work. So the best thing is really to integrate end users to every phase of design and production so that you consult them before you start designing. Then when you have something to show, you seek feedback and you do this um, throughout the project. So the message today is don't be uh, as the team of people that designed big for her. We can be better than that, I think. So. How do we solve this uh, main uh, issues? Well, the good news for you is that there's loads of work in the field uh, and I'll be talking about how we've um, addressed this in our own work. The field of integrated access is one that I would recommend you looking into. Integrated access basically uh, argues that creative teams and accessibility teams should work together to create accessible productions. And the really exciting thing about this research is that it shows that when we do this, we actually create accessible experiences that are of a greater quality and that are perceived as having the seal of approval of the, cre of the creators. And if you'd like to look at work, uh, I would definitely recommend the work by Louise Fryer, who's worked a lot on um, 
film and theater, uh, but also the work by Patrick Udo and Deborah Fells uh, and Hannah Thompson and Amelia Cavallo. And I can put this in writing later, but loads of research in this field. Similarly, accessible filmmaking advocates for the incorporation of accessibility methods to the film uh, creative and technical workflows. So accessibility is no longer something that we add at the end, so it's not an afterthought, it is actually integral, just as cinematography, just as sound design, just as editing, just as directing. And these two fields are connected with something called universal design, which some of you might be familiar with. Universal design is um, a concept that comes from uh, building design, architecture and product design. And it basically uh, advocates for the incorporation of accessibility from the design process. And the really important thing about universal design is that it has been shown that when we consider accessibility from the start of the design, we, uh, we have uh, a cheaper, a lower cost of accessibility as, uh, as a result. Uh, but we also have a more aesthetically, aesthetically pleasing product. And we have often products that benefit many more users than the intended end users. A typical example, uh, and I apologize by the cliche uh, nature of this example, but it's a clear one, is the example of the ramp, a ramp in a building. Ramps in buildings are there for wheelchair users. But if you've ever found yourself, maybe not in 2020, but before then, uh, found yourself traveling and you approach this building with this uh, stairs and you have two heavy suitcases, you look at the ramp and you say, well, I'm, def I'm definitely taking the ramp. Now the ramp isn't there for me, but I can benefit from that. And this is something that's really important to think uh, about accessibility. Accessibility makes things better for everyone. Now, what does this have to do with audio? And what I would like to introduce you to is uh, the Enhancing Audio Description Project. So the Enhancing Audio Description Project was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And I was the principal investigator for it. The co-investigator was Dr. Gavin Kearney and our research assistant was um, the amazing Christian Hofstadter. And the really uh, key central theme of enhancing audio description was to provide an alternative to traditional audio description practices. And this is where we really acknowledge that need for diversity. So instead of just having audio description on or off, we can have another method of accessibility. This also advocated, the project advocated for the incorporation of this accessibility methods to film and television workflows. And as you will see, we consulted visually impaired users all throughout the process. Now, what is enhanced audio description? Enhancing audio description uh, is a combination of three sound design methods. One of them is the addition of sound effects to uh, clarify actions and presence of characters and convey abstract scenes. And this is, for example, um, an, a, a case of use could be Say your film has a lovely music montage, beautiful cinematography, beautiful music score, but completely inaccessible as a result. Instead of adding an audio description track, what you can do is reintegrate the sound effects to that sequence. So suddenly you can hear the seagulls uh, in, in the sky, you can hear the sea, you can hear the footsteps of the characters, you can hear their breathing. So all these elements make the characters present for those that cannot see the screen. Another uh, method that we use is spatial audio. And in this case, we specialize in binaural um, audio. And spatial audio is an incredibly powerful tool for accessibility. It can tell um, visually impaired audiences where characters are and where sounding objects are. So you could, for example, convey uh, the setting of a scene by having, uh, say, a fireplace on your right surround, someone drinking uh, a glass of whiskey um, on your left and a door opening, um, sorry, left surround and a door opening on your left. You could have your character moving from the center to your right surround. This isn't something that happens in traditional film mixing because film mixing, uh, most of the cases uh, leaves the dialogue in the center to keep uh, the audiences focused on the screen. But if the screen is not important anymore, then we can just pan the dialogue however we wish so that it follows the movement of the characters. So we're setting a scene orally pretty much immediately. 
The third um, method we use is the I voice, which is a term by Michelle Chion, which is basically a first person narration. For, so the, for those elements that cannot be conveyed through sound effects or spatial audio, things like gestures, colors, we have a first person narrator telling us that information that is crucial. That is crucial. So it creates this really poetic form of accessibility. And all this requires incorporation from development of a film or TV program up to delivery. We created, uh, um, we redesigned rather the soundtrack of a short film uh, called Pearl. The film is fully available in its enhanced audio description format online. So I'm happy to share the link with you later on so that you can uh, uh, watch it and experience the audio uh, at full quality. And as uh, what we see in the picture here is uh, one of our focus groups in which participants watched uh, Pearl and uh, provided um, provided feedback and I think there's there's a guide dog in the um, in the picture uh, relaxing uh, while uh, its owner um, their owner watches the film. The way we operated with Pearl is exactly how I described before. We consulted end users before we started designing. We explained what our ideas would be and we sought feedback. Then we had uh, interviews once the design was completed. Then we tweaked the soundtrack and then we had another set of focus, focus groups afterwards. And it's important to note the last set of focus groups was actually mixed focus groups with visually impaired and sighted audiences. And this is because as I mentioned before, our ethos was to create something that uh, would benefit everyone and that would encourage sharing of experiences. And it was really, really um, interesting to hear uh, a lot of participants saying that enhancing audio description and the fact that everybody wore headphones um, to the screening made, um, made them feel more included. So it created a greater sense of social cohesion and it reduced senses of segregation, which uh, may be felt when someone has to access headphones in a cinema for audio description and they're the only ones uh, using them. So a format that was enjoyed by visually impaired and sighted audiences and created a sense of social, um, social inclusion. Another thing we did was to explore how this methods would be utilized or could be utilized by a group of filmmakers that were external to the research team. And what we see on screen is the poster of the film uh, we, um, we worked on that is called Shelf Life with a tagline that is humanity has an expiry date. So it's a bit, it's not very jolly, but hey. And the main image is uh, a knife that uh, the blade is split and half of it is uh, veins and the other half is a circuit board. And this project um, encouraged the students to incorporate these methods from the start of the production work. And it was really, really interesting because with Pearl, that was uh, the work of uh, Gavin Carney and myself, we were quite experimental in how we used sound design uh, and spatial audio, where whether we found that when the students were left to make their decisions, they, um, they funnily enough created something that was overly verbal. So it over relied on first person narration, which is, not exactly what the methods are for. So first person narration for us is the last of the methods. Uh, and this is so that we can let the soundtrack speak for itself. But it's interesting to see how, when we left the guidelines to uh, a group of people external to the research, uh, how they interpreted it. The film is not available online at the minute because we caption everything before we make them available. So my, uh, my, my Christmas job is to caption shelf life so that we can make it, um, we can make it available. Uh, the project, as I said, was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and we're really, really proud to have had the support of a wonderful team of um, members of a project advisory panel. So huge thanks to ITV, Sonoris Post, Dolby, Lisa Holtzworth, RNIB, Sensor Media and CamSide. We really wouldn't have been able to do the project without them. So we're really glad to have had their support. If you're interested in having access to the journal papers, we have all the stats all the graphs, uh, etc. please feel free to email me at mariana.lopez at york.ac.uk. And I will post the links this afternoon to, uh, to Pearl and other resources through my Twitter account, which is mariana underscore 
J underscore Lopez. And our website is enhancingaudiodescription.com. So thank you very much uh, for listening. And I have, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much. <laughs>